Welcome to Moment of Truth with Amy Chen Mills. That's me. And today, also guest co-host and Moment of Truth team member, Mei-Ling Obinata, who pulled our amazing guests together for today's show. This evening, we take a deep dive into the myths and realities of affordable housing. Whatever your opinions about how to fix housing in the United States, one thing is clear. There is a housing crisis in this nation. Either there is not enough housing or it is far too expensive or both. One could argue that a flat U.S. minimum wage, declining union and labor power now apparently making a comeback, and decades of neoliberal capitalist policies have created a wealth disparity and dearth of social programs, including health care and social housing that have led to an epidemic of unhoused and underhoused seniors, adults, children, and families across the nation. In our own Northern California community, an ongoing struggle rages between those who believe for-profit developers will fix it all if we only give them free reign to build, baby, build, and those who believe we must mandate that developers provide more affordable housing and that our governments generate or shift tax revenues to buy land and build 100% affordable housing for ordinary people. This election cycle, the struggle continues in the battle over local Measure M, which would make zoning changes in the Santa Cruz General Plan related to height of buildings or density subject to a citywide vote and tack an additional 5% of mandated affordable housing on to all housing developments for a grand total of 25% before any state density bonuses. A density bonus is additional added units permitted as a gift by the state. Just up the coast from our county, San Francisco has seen a troubling alliance between centrist Democrats and YIMBY, or Yes in My Backyard proponents like Scott Weiner, and tech and real estate millionaires and billionaires like David Sachs, who have thrown millions of dollars into recalling a progressive DA and three social justice-oriented San Francisco school board members. Some of these wealthy executives back charter schools and a more GOP-aligned, tough-on-crime philosophy. A recent article in the London Review of Books by Rebecca Solnit titled In the Shadow of Silicon Valley is an historical and in-depth musing, musing on how tech companies and tech money have both hollowed out and now begun to politically and philosophically alter the character of our beautiful Baghdad by the Bay. So which is it? Will an industry like development that is primarily about making maximum profits off of real estate somehow also lessen rents and the cost of buying homes in high demand cities? Or must we intervene as a concerned public to stop gentrification and unhindered growth? These are the questions that we want to ask our amazing guests that we have online with us today and also in the studio, uh, starting with Amadi Ozie, Assistant Professor of English at UW-Madison and a community builder with Madison Tenant Power in Madison, Wisconsin, who has previously worked with the Crown Heights Tenant Union and the Crown Heights Care Collective, which they co-founded in Brooklyn, New York. Their political priorities include universal housing, universal health care, including abortion care, and racial trauma-informed support and advocacy. Welcome, Amadi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're so glad that you could join us. We also have on the line with us, with us Josh the Rad Planner who hosts a YouTube channel platforming critiques on neoliberal urban land use policies within a U.S. context. Josh is a practicing urban planner with 10 years of experience in land use and transportation planning with an equity focus. He currently works for Mid-Atlantic Cities and lives in Philadelphia. Using his expertise in urban planning, Josh creates his educational videos to add depth to the ongoing urban crisis discussion. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Reggie Meisler. Reggie Meisler is actually in studio with us this evening, a local activist who has campaigned for rent control and the recent 
empty home tax measure in Santa Cruz, California, which failed, thanks in part to funding from the real estate industry. Reggie is also a member of Santa Cruz Cares, advocating for the rights of unhoused residents on the streets of Santa Cruz. I want to make a note that we emailed Yimby California and Santa Cruz Yimby regarding questions we have about California Yimby connections to the far-right Manhattan Institute and asked if they would come on our program. The Santa Cruz local group directed us to the statewide group and said they were not affiliated with the statewide or California group, but with EMB Action. They have not so far clarified what these different groups are or how they relate to one another. And we're going to go ahead and start with Amadi then and um, Reggie Meisler with our first question, which is basically about this question or this dichotomy or this pressure, this paradox that we have especially in our community, which isn't far from Silicon Valley, which isn't far from San Francisco. There's a lot of pressure here to build, um, and we're seeing that reflected in the makeup of our current city council and our planning commission. And then there's pushback from residents who are saying, we don't have to just allow market rate housing and for developers to build, build, and build. Let's actually, we'll start with Amadi, and then we'll go to Josh. Amadi, do you have any thoughts about this market rate solution to building housing, which really it's actually, I think there's a bill at the national level that's sort of along the lines of YIMBY. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that, so I live in Madison, Wisconsin, which I think has a probably a similar uh, landscape to Santa Cruz and that there is also like a huge pressure to build, build, build. Like it is like a fairly high density city, but it's growing every, all the time. Yeah. And so there's like a low vacancy rate. Um, so there's a pressure to build, but there's not a lot of oversight once those properties get built. So you get these like large so-called luxury high rises um, that are designed to fall apart within five years. You know, the elevator's broken, your laundry's broken, et cetera. Um, so you get that. And then we know that there's this like runaway rent profiteering scheme like across the country. So it's not just that like people's rents are increasing, people's rents are increasing at an astronomical rate and they're increasing at a rate that completely, is completely separate from our wages. And uh, Josh, are you with us now? Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you have a whole YouTube channel called, I believe, Radical Planning. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. And so, I mean, I'm someone who I try to read widely on this issue, and I still get very confused. You know, we do have... Um, a, a housing crisis. I mean, people are sleeping in their cars. We have a university. We have students sleeping in their cars. We have no no housing or no affordable housing for our basically our workforce here. Um, and we, of course, have all kinds of unhoused people. Per capita, we may be the number one city in California, number one or number two for, for unhoused. Uh, individuals here. Um, and so it's like there's this pressure. I mean, it's like, yeah, I kind of want to say, yeah, let's build housing too. So tell tell us how you see this issue of we just need to build, 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 let the market do its job versus what what else could we be doing? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly why I started my YouTube channel. It's that uh, YIMBYs mostly and developers are presenting this idea that there's a very simple solution to the housing crisis and that it's just to build more housing. But there's not a huge body of evidence that backs that up. There are studies that indicate perhaps there is a trickle down effect that will slow the rate of rent increase, not to say that rents will decrease, but ultimately a lack of decommodified housing is, I would argue, causing the rental market to continue to grow at an uncontrolled rate. What, what I mean by decommodified housing would be things like public housing or permanently affordable housing, things that don't have the profit motive behind them. Uh, and those are much more complicated to construct, to build. And it just, it seems to be a very simple answer to say, we'll just build more of everything when really the only thing being built right now 
is market rate housing with some small percentage of affordable housing. Right, and affordable, I just want to be very clear, in our county, actually I think this might be for our, no, I think it's for our county, uh, a, a low income person is making $92,000 a year. A low income, a very low income person is making $57,650 a year. So this is what we're talking about when we're even talking about affordable housing. Like we're not even getting near people who are struggling on their social security checks or their disability checks if they're getting any checks at all. A family of four low income in Santa Cruz compared to incomes nationally, right, and across the state, low income for a family of four is $132,000 a year. Very low income for a family of four is $82,350. Reggie, do you want to speak to this also? I think that uh, you make such a solid point about this, Amy. You know, so much of our housing policies that we have are for profiteers and by profiteers. And so, you know, we're kind of constantly stuck in this mode of like, well, do you want affordable housing? Well, you need to build like 75%, 80% or more of market rate to get it and through the inclusionary zoning. Um, And then of course, like you say, inclusionary zoning is um, based on these income bands of area median income. And I don't work locally and I'm a software developer. There's a lot of people who don't work locally in Santa Cruz and that distorts the area median income because people work in finance, they work in tech, they work in things that don't need to be local. And so area median income has nothing to do with local. If we were serious about affordable housing, we would use the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is also a local metric. And if you look at that, uh, I believe the median income was something like $41,000, which is much more, you know, that seems actually about right. That does seem about right, according to people that I've talked to. Well, I have a question uh, for Amadi about who or what controls affordable housing in the U.S. for tenants. Um, I remember you mentioning that there are um, corporations which are active in multiple states. Uh, maybe you could discuss that a bit here. By corporations, do you mean like 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 development corporations or were they corporate landlords, Amadi? Like talking about corporatized housing. Mm-hmm. First, I did want to say something about the area median income, yeah, which is a, also a problem or a, a feature of the landscape here in Madison, where like the area median income, like thirty percent area median income is like what eleven hundred dollars or something for a one bedroom account uh, apartment, which is like not affordable. Right, so the actual battleground for affordable housing is different. Go back, remind me of your question. Who or what is controlling, like what determines affordable housing for tenants in the United Mm -hmm. States? If we can kind of have a, yeah, like a big picture because it's not just local factors, it could be national as well. Right, yeah, I think that one of the things that people uh, imagine when they're thinking about like the fight between tenants and landlords, you're imagining like mom and pop landlords and people who like, you know, are renting out their first home and stuff like that. But we're actually fighting like big mega billion dollar corporations that operate in like multiple states at once. So like uh, a good example of one that operates here in Wisconsin and also elsewhere in the Midwest and in California is Core Spaces. I know that Core Spaces has several buildings in Santa Cruz, in Santa Monica, I believe, in Chicago, in Madison, and they like to buy up, um, you know, uh, real estate in competitive areas with a lot of student housing, right? Um, because they know that students are less likely to advocate for themselves, um, and they're also more likely to move out at, a, at, at you know, have a higher turnaround rate. And so I have a question related to this, um, and that has to do with, because I want to throw some YIMBY arguments in here, because that's really what's happening in our community. There's a very, a very strong local YIMBY group that has at least a big political presence here, and our council, and you know, has been opposed to, and uh, also this group called Santa Cruz Together, which 
funds a lot of has, has funded a lot of our campaigns has been a po- even though everyone's like let's go for housing there when there's something like we had a measure n which was an empty homes tax let's start taxing these empty homes that are probably second homes for the most part or if there's a company that owns an apartment building they can't just let those apartments sit because they want to rate wait for rents to go up or or whatever whatever um and we're not we don't see any pushback any significant pushback as far as I'm concerned from, you know, some of these EMB folks. And so, Josh, I wanted to direct this to you, and then maybe we can go to Reggie on this. Why is that? Because there is a real messaging from the local EMB group. And again, feel free to call in if you want to speak on behalf of EMB. Is there a, a, a reason why we're not seeing an alignment between these EMB groups and like actual pushback on corporate realty? Is that just a dumb question? But I think, <laughs> I mean, I because I, I sympathize sometimes. I'm like, oh yeah, we really need housing. It's such a crisis. So Josh, do you have any thoughts about why we don't see that kind of alignment more so? Sure. Are you asking why there isn't a YIMBY push against vacancies? Vacancies. Um, you know, we right now there's a the YIMBY push here is to not make the the new measure having 25 percent. Like they don't want this 25 percent affordable housing tacked on um, to um, developers, which is what we're looking at at the ballot on March the 5th, for example. Just sort of like more so pro, I guess you could say socialized or uh, um, nonprofit, not for profit solutions to the problem. I think what it comes down to is that the EMB ideology is opposed to any restrictions to the private market. It's their belief that we have had decades of restrictions and therefore we have not built enough housing. So to them, typically any additional encumberment to a developer, to a property owner is, uh, as they see it, something that will drive up costs or rents. I would never expect uh, personally to see an alliance between, say, people who are against warehousing, which is what I think you're describing, where a landlord may hold several units off the market. People against warehousing and the YIMBY movement, I just don't see any alignment in ideology there. Gotcha. Reggie, did you want to comment? Yeah, I agree with Josh about why this is. I think there's also kind of a a class character to people who I think end up in the YIMBY movement as opposed to a tenant rights movement, for instance, which is that a lot of folks grow up middle class. They don't really know. They, they, a lot of folks, especially the younger folks in the YIMBY movement, I get the sense that they're paying rent with student loans. And so they don't have quite an awareness of what it, like, how much can I sell my labor for and how much you know, will that afford rent? Like that, that class awareness is not quite there yet with some of the younger YIMBYs, um, which I think is actually where most of the sort of grassroots YIMBY movement is. I think people who are older, um, I don't sense that uh, there is actually an, an honest sort of uh, grappling with the YIMBY rhetoric and what they actually are trying to achieve. Amadi, I just had a question to follow up with what Reggie is saying about the class character that makes it so that people are more attracted to one movement over another. What are you seeing in Madison, which uh, from what I remember is home to like an excellent computer science department in, in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, and uh, right. So, is if that's a, like a tech corridor, are you? What do you observe about? Uh, intersectionality and class among uh, the tenant uh, power community. Good. Yeah. I mean, I definitely see gentrification as a factor here in Madison. So we have like this tech sec, this active tech sector in Madison. Um, there's like a active medical tech community um, from Epic, um, which is a pretty large uh, supplier, um, like computer software developer in town. Um, there's the universities, multiple university colleges and universities, um, and UW Madison is like on the most competitive, like swatch of real estate in town. 
Um, then there's all these legislative lawmakers who come into town um, for like four months out of the year. All that makes the um, the uh, class dynamics of the city pretty varied. That being said, that's what also attract, attracts people to the tenant movement. You know, like on one side, like we have the ruling class people who will say like, oh yeah, we're going to raise your rent by $200 a month. There you go, you know, safe investment. And then on the other side, you have people who say, I cannot afford that. That is literally groceries, that's transportation, that's daycare, et cetera. I cannot afford that. There's that, That's an addiction. Um, and so like that disconnect um, is also kind of like how we are able to have conversations about changing um, the housing uh, dynamic. Thanks, Amadi. Um, I have a question for Josh. I remember, uh, I think you have a video about how landlords can use dating apps. Could you tell us <laughs> why do they need to have dating apps? What? <laughs> are, yeah, are they lonely? <laughs> so that was, you know, a clickbait title <laughs> that didn't really pan out. Um, but yeah, landlords do use apps to communicate with each other indirectly. Uh, this is a category of uh, things called property technology or prop tech. Uh, right now, there's a very large case against the company RealPage, which but to sum it up, they basically would, uh, landlords would submit the rents they were charging and then RealPage would aggregate that and deliver that back out to other landlords in the area. And that is potentially uh, very likely collusion um, to do it at the level they were doing it. And there was also like a uh, like a, a, a chat board, a, a forum where landlords could just directly say how much they were charging in rent. Um, but yeah, we, we're in a situation now where you can use these technologies, even even ones that seem harmless like Zillow, to share rents and the landlord can see like, oh, everybody around me is charging 1200, 1300. I can do 1350 just fine. And we're, we're in a situation where PropTech is helping landlords increase. There's no, the, the competition that free marketeers are promising is kind of dissolved based on property tech. I just want to read a couple emails that came in. We had some indicating uh, Santa Cruz EMB supported Measure M and, and another email. EMB is pro-housing of all types. The reality is market rate housing is the most feasible type of housing we can build, but we want housing of all types, including workforce housing and social housing. Okay, I just want to comment on that because I do know the central organizer for N, and um, and Reggie, you might want to comment as well as someone who was working for that campaign too. You know, the, the it felt like there was sort of lip service paid to N, uh, is what I've heard, uh, but actually no real sort of like you know resources, labor, money, that kind of thing. Well, I wouldn't say that. I. I did some stuff with N, and um, there were a couple, at least two or three people from the local Yimby group who would do like text banking, and I think maybe a little door knocking. So there was some. I mean, this is kind of a, a strange thing, right? Because the local Yimby group, in terms of who's actually organized, is quite small. It's about like maybe eight to ten people at most, uh, from my experience. And then the, the email list, I imagine, is quite a bit larger. Um, and so I guess I, I have to say, though, that when I talk with local Yimby people, I do get the sense that they care deeply about housing. I get the sense that they care deeply about people being able to live here. Sometimes it's about people's kids living here, which is, you know, some of these things I'm like, I never expected my kids to necessarily be able to live here, but people do have that sense. And then also just people who are working in our in our city. I, like, I get that. Um, but then there's like this real pushback on you know adding anything that would create any burden to developers. And Josh, I wanted to ask you about this 25% thing, the inclusionary rates. Have you looked into this at all? Like because we keep hearing, 
well, no one really knows. The developers aren't really opening their books for us. And we had a study in the city council that said this would be prohibitive to developers, and it doesn't pencil out. We hear that a lot. Do you want to speak to that, uh, those inclusionary rates at all? Uh, sure. Yeah. The, the developer will always say that it won't pencil out, I think, with the inclusionary rates. It's never going to be attractive in the way that not having them would be. Uh, but many cities do have inclusionary zoning and they're growing cities like D.C., for example, has, uh, I believe it's 18 uh, percent, something, something between 10 and 18 and sometimes even higher, depending. Um, I think that it's just something that the planners would have to stick to. They would just have to not fold. And more importantly, if this is my opinion, for inclusionary zoning, I think there are oftentimes uh, added in uh, benefits to the developer where they could maybe build that affordable housing somewhere else. Like they could do it off site or they could contribute to a, a housing trust fund yep. or something. Mm -hmm. And and those are ways that it kind of diminishes the purpose of the inclusionary zoning. Yeah, that actually happens quite a bit um, in our community from what I understand. And our question before we go to break, the half hour break is, well then, so what is what does affordable housing mean to you? What does that look like to you um, if it's not let's build more and more market rate housing and also maybe include a little bit of affordable housing if it is truly affordable, right, in there. Um, so let's go to Amadi and then we'll go to Reggie and then we'll go to Josh. Yeah, I mean, if you're building housing for profit, period, you're kind of like reproducing the issue by not by barely addressing the symptoms, right? If what like what is the root cause of the inequality in our access to space? And the answer is greed. The answer is the control of capital um, to protect the already steep profits of multi-billionaires. And so we have to shift our approach, shift the way that we consciously think about housing, right? So we shouldn't be thinking about housing as a commodity. We should be thinking about it as a human right. And if it's a human right, that means that, you know, we divert funding in order to pay for housing. Um, like we could have, for instance, people are talking about a real estate transfer tax here, which I, I feel like people have thought about and tried before, but people are now thinking about it again, um, where, pe you know, people who have more money to spend to give, you know, real estate companies, um, can donate to something like that. Would that be kind of what you're talking about, Amadi? I mean, let's keep in mind that real estate is still the most secure investment that a person can make, by far the most secure investment that a person can make. So there is definitely wiggle room for thinking about how to um, tax people who are already making a lot of money off of real estate by treating people's homes as an investment. Uh, you know, we're going to have to go to our half hour break and we'll come right back and hear from Reggie Meisler and Josh the Rad Planner. You're listening to Moment of Truth with Amy Chen Mills. We're talking about myths and realities of affordable housing. And we'll be right back. Also, the Pope lives in a 15-minute city. Anyway, let's talk about some freaking liberals. Liberals and the 15-minute city. In researching how different cities implement 15-minute concepts, you find similar statements about the need for public engagement, methods for creating car-free or car-light areas, and means to encourage land use changes. However, in practice, 15-minute cities might seem like a carrot for developers while being a stick for residents. A city government under neoliberal capitalism has very few tools to radically change where amenities are located and who gets to enjoy them. What we're seeing with 15-minute city implementation are zoning changes, car restrictions, and low-level beautification projects. It's possible that making these investments in particular neighborhoods, a city government could initiate the gentrification process. Those who benefit the most from 15-minute cities are those who work and live in the same place. People who work from home are the most likely candidates to seek out a 15-minute type city not only because they have the freedom to live wherever they want, 
but also because they have the financial means to live in amenities-rich neighborhoods. People who work from home tend to have much higher paying jobs. Without tenant protections and no public housing, there's no guarantee that lower income residents will be able to remain in their neighborhoods as they convert to 15 minute cities. There's nothing a city can do without acquiring more land to actually guarantee a 15 minute city. A city can't say specifically, we need a grocery store here. We need a coffee shop here. We need offices here. That's only something they can allow. They would still need the private market to decide that those locations are profitable. Carlos Moreno has admitted that the 15 minute city falls short here. He says, there are aspects of this for which we do not have a solution because it's a matter that's up to private enterprise to change. That was Josh the Radical Planner uh, with one of his videos at his YouTube channel called Radical Planning on 15 Minute Cities. Um, and we were talking about affordable housing uh, and we're looking at it from a more systemic perspective, which I appreciate. It's been very confusing to me. I mean, we have 15 minute cities now. We have strong towns. We have uh, Yimby. We have we had Capitola Yimby for a while, and and now we have better. And we have so many different organizations now. All of a sudden, like weighing in on this issue. Um, and our last question was, what does affordable housing mean to you? We talked to Amadi, who who does a lot of tenant organizing in Wisconsin and has done a lot also in. Uh, in, I believe, uh, Crown Heights in Brooklyn, New York. And we have Reggie Meisler, who works directly with the unhoused um, in supporting their rights to live in their trailers and RVs in our city. Reggie, what does affordable housing mean to you? Um, I really like a lot of what Amadi had to say about this. I think uh, I almost don't like the term affordable housing. I, it implies that housing is by default unaffordable and that we need a special kind of housing to be affordable. I think that like uh, a big part of the problem is the fact that housing is not only an investment, it is an investment, um, it is the best investment. Residential real estate is the largest asset in the global economy, it's the largest asset in the US economy. The average American, 70% of their wealth is in their home. And here in Santa Cruz, uh, we all collectively are about two thirds rent burden. That means like two thirds of all our income goes toward our mortgage or our rent. And so we're in this situation where just our economy is just eaten by land and housing. And uh, Amadi really sort of like summed it up that it's a really a profit issue. What is your solution? What, what would you see as affordable housing, like community land trust? Or? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's basically what it is, is land that is decommodified. Um, and so the building on the land uh, is really all you sort of need to worry about. But even in that case, I think it is dangerous to have even decommodified land with for-profit buildings on top, because we see even in places like Singapore, which have an almost community land trust style of social housing, that that eventually becomes unsustainable as well as people try to sell their units on a market, um, even when the land value is taken out of the equation. And Josh, uh, I don't think we asked you this question yet. Uh, not yet. Go for it. Uh, personally, I think that we need a massive expansion of public housing. I think that is the clearest path forward to decommodifying the housing market. Yeah. And um, OK, so I just I want to just throw something out there because uh, some of us have been in active conversations with the MB folks here in town. And um, I'm just going to sort of make an argument on their behalf because nobody's here from YMB. I mean, given that we don't have a huge movement at the federal level to build low income housing, given that, especially in our city, there isn't a lot of land. There is some public land that we could be looking at. And a lot of, you know, lefty people are like, let's build public housing on public land. Let's not give this all up to developers. Uh, there is that movement, but we haven't seen the political will here in our city. And there's so much money in the real estate industry. There's so much money that comes into our town via, you know, like the Santa Cruz Together Pack and so forth to support our city council members who are, you know, who basically, I don't know what, if they, you know, make some kind of a deal. I, I'm, I can't say that at all, but they tend to vote pro-developer. The planning commission now is very pro-developer. Maybe, maybe there's a feeling like just of giving up, like, well, let's just at least then just build housing. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to open this to anyone's comments from, you know, 
uh, Amadi to Josh to Reggie or Mailing. Like maybe it's like let's just do this because it, it does feel like an emergency. Thoughts? Anyone? Uh, yeah, I think that it's interesting. the The Yimby movement does a great job at at building support. I think that they're able to create like massive amounts of content and. You know, there's a lot of tweeters. Uh, there's a lot of things that they put out there that support their ideas. And then very often they'll turn around and say, well, repealing these laws that prevent public housing and, and trying to increase the budget for public housing is impossible or difficult. And I think that, to me, that's my biggest qualm with the Yemi movement is that it's kind of an uh, anti Organizing. It's, a, it's an anti-movement in that all of this energy that is being expended to get support for developers, which already have the full support of all of our politicians, it, it's being wasted. And, and all, all of us should be organizing to you know, increase public housing construction. I think that, you know, that, is, that is the problem, is that we have to unite together and build this movement and so many people like you said maybe feel defeated or you know feel like there's nothing we can do when really we're supposed to be working together and figuring it out Hmm. Amadi I just wanted to ask you if you want to respond to some of what Josh Josh is saying uh, as part of the autonomous tenants union do you have kind of like a national lens on how there's an overlap between the political interests of landlords and developers? Yeah, I mean, there is, first I wanted to agree or second that there is so much energy around the housing crisis because just so many people recognize that there is an issue, that there is a deficit, um, even though we might all have different kind or name different kinds of solutions or resolutions for addressing that deficit. Um, On the national level, like I know that we came out with a a, like a nationalized tenant bill of rights um, that like uh, named some of the corp issues facing all renters across the country as being about affordability and accessibility and discrimination or anti-discrimination, you know what I mean? And that's everybody, right? Um, So I think that there is something to being able to talk to your own neighbors, talk to your own friends about what they're noticing with their own two eyes about the state of the housing movement in their city and how they can get involved. Because I mean, that's the real thing is that like, it's not really, the real deficit is just a deficit of mobilization, right? We all know that housing is one of the core issues facing most Americans in this country, and now we just need to talk to each other about it. Thanks, Amani. Josh, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Uh, A lot of this comes from the local level, creating connections with each other nearby. I think that, you know, ultimately, we need some sort of uh, single single movement. Like we need to have some banner to unite under, which is, I guess, the greatest strength of the Yimby movement, right? They have this word, they have this branding almost. And I just don't see that for the other side of things yet. Yeah, and I, I want to speak to that a little bit because I think one of the things that Yimby, yes, in my backyard, is pointing out, which I think is probably a good thing, is some of the zoning uh, that we do have, like in our city, a lot of single family zoning, a lot of, you know, actual nimbyism when someone wants to build something that's like for very low income, maybe supportive housing, there's pushback, there's big meetings. And so that's something I think we do need to look at as a community that I've had to think about. I'm in a single family zoned area and I've had to think about okay is it going to be okay if someone wants to come and build like you know a four-story apartment building down the street and I and I'm like okay I want to be okay with that right but then also we're lumped in it's it's confusing to me because we start getting lumped in with 
you know, these sort of big real estate lobbies. And all of a sudden, you know, Mailing was finding out, I believe it was Mailing who found out on our Moment of Truth team that Nolan Gray, who's a research director at California EMB, was also writing for the Manhattan Institute, which is where Christopher Rufo is, who's the author of the anti uh, critical race theory, uh, you know, movement across the United States, very racist, very oppressive, all kinds of anti LGBTQ plus stuff, apologists for Clarence Thomas. I mean, so then I was like, okay, wait a second, you know, um, Reggie, you look like you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think uh, the one thing that's a little bit interesting um, is that uh, there's kind of a difference in rhetoric versus uh, where the rubber meets the road with some of this YIMBY stuff. Because when we start talking about upzoning, um, I think uh, the YIMBYs make a very valid point uh, that there are uh, wealthy white exclusionary neighborhoods, especially in Santa Cruz, like the Upper West Side, that could use apartments in them. Um, but when upzone rubber meets the road, where do we upzone it? They add this little flavor of near transit. And where is near transit? Well, that tends to be in the already upzoned, already more colorful, diverse, poorer parts of the city, like downtown and beach flats. In our and, city. Right. And and at the at the at a, what you start to realize is that where the upzoning tends to happen based on this little qualifier that they add is not in the white exclusionary neighborhoods of rich people, but in the poor, politically expedient, market-centric, where the rent gap is really high neighborhoods, right? Which makes sense, right? Because that's obviously where people want to build anyways. But uh, I just think that I just wanted to call out that sort of like little qualifier with how there's YIMBY rhetoric, which I think a lot of young YIMBYs uh, latch on to because it's idealistic, and it's it's good rhetoric oftentimes. But then when the rubber meets the road, you have to really pay attention because that's where basically the capitalist interests just fully take control of what happens. Thanks, Reggie. Amadi, I wanted to ask you about the role of upzoning and development on things like reasonable rents or rather the rate the rent prices is there something that you've observed um here in madison i mean zoning and rezoning fights is like one of the big battlegrounds i mean um here like i, I mean the like the landscape just looks a little different just because Madison is historically like small town with a small town vibe. So that's kind of like the, the character of like the NIMBY movement here mm -hmm. is like kind of resisting um, urbanization, like resisting the urbanization of Madison, even though this is like a city, like a real city, people don't want it to look like a city. Um, so that's one aspect of the character of the upzoning or zoning fights here um can you yeah we have more? that we have that too actually in our city as people are you know we had all of a sudden a proposal from the city council for maybe 17 story buildings it was looking like and then that got amended because there was this huge sort of response um and i guess that question might go to do, does it matter the character of our of our cities? Does it matter that they be pedestrian or human scale? Lamadi, what do you think about that? I mean, it's just a question of human, what the what that scale looks like. Uh, in Madison, there's a ordinance again, against any building being taller than the Capitol building. So there's no, like, you know, you can't have a building that's long, taller than like eight stories or something. I'm not afraid of a 14 story building. Does every story, uh, does every city need to have 27 story buildings or 50 story buildings? No. Um, but I also think that there is like a space for like larger complexes, larger scale homes it, that fit in, fit in a walkable neighborhood, right? Um, that is part of a community. 
Like, I don't think urbanization is like separate from community or community building. So along those lines, we have a question. Uh, I believe we should direct this to Josh because of the clip that we played from your YouTube channel, Radical Planning. Uh, from your video called 15 Minute Cities. Aren't most European cities 15 Minute Cities? Is it not a leftist principle to live in close community with each other and be able to meet our basic needs? Do you actually have a problem with the core idea of 15 Minute Cities or just what it means for development? Josh. Josh, the radical planner. Yeah, that's a 35 minute video. (laughs) <laughs> and I, <laughs> I so approach watch it. it. <laughs> please, yeah, please watch it. Um, I approach it from three sides. I I take it from the conservative side, the like purely like anti fifty minute side. Then I approach it from the liberal developer friendly side, and then I do spend quite a bit of time discussing what a leftist city would be. But to respond to this email in particular, I don't think there is anything inherently leftist about the way that Europe is developed. I don't think that walkability is uh, inherently anything politically. I don't think that density is anything inherently politically. It's, it's what walkability does. It's who benefits from it. Uh, it's who, who creates it. I think that you know you could live like take Budapest, for example, is operating under a a very far right government. Uh, You know, is that a is is it being a stunningly beautiful, walkable city? Does that make it more leftist uh, when the government is borderline fascist? You know, I don't know. So I think that my video would have more answers than that statement. But um, ultimately, no, I don't agree that walkability is inherently a sign of leftist values. We have another email question. Mailing's going to read it. Amy, what is your feasible solution to the housing crisis? Who is going to start this sudden movement to create community land trusts? At least Yimby is working towards their solutions and seeing success. You mean they want my opinion? <laughs> or I, it's addressed to you, but I think I know, it's a fair can, question for any guest. Yeah, and that um, actually goes to our next questions. What is the be- what can we work toward? I mean, I'll just say personally, I'm supporting candidates who I think would support a, p- a community land trust. I'm supporting candidates for council who I think would um, actually put a, push for some kind of tax on either a parcel tax or a real estate transfer tax. Um, but let's ask that question to our experts here. Um, Reggie, what is your solution? Because it's easy for leftists to say no, no, no. What are we saying yes to? Uh, I would say RVs and on city streets because (laughs) an RV is basically a studio apartment. If you put an RV in an RV park, now you don't call them homeless. And this is, you know, the cost to build a new deeply affordable unit of uh, housing is like a million dollars. So just to house the 1,000 unhoused folks in the county of Santa Cruz, or maybe it's the city actually, is a billion dollars at that price point. So I just think that we're too far gone in the like massive like profit accumulation of residential real estate. We need real estate values to go down and we need strategies that will bring that down, create competition in the market and uh, serve the needs of the people who need housing the most, like the unhoused and people who are precariously housed in slumlord housing. And so I think uh, that is uh, what I really advocate for at this point. Okay, so let's go to Amadi. Uh, what are your yeses? What are your solutions? I mean, I know you're doing tenant organizing. You've talked about it. I think a few other solutions, but you know, what what are you what are you thinking in response to this question? Yeah, I mean, I would say like the easiest low level way to get involved is to talk to your own neighbors, right, and push back at every level. That means like pushing back um, at issues that you encounter in your own building, things that you experience in your neighborhood, um, all the way up to the state and national level, right? I don't, I think that what we want is to make sure that real estate seems like a less secure, less profitable investment. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, To make it less profitable, 
uh, for developers. What about, okay, I, I mean, what about, like, I have a home. I'm feeling like this is almost, you know, all I've got sometimes. You know, uh, we don't have a government that's going to help us out in retirement necessarily. Now we're looking at possibly, you know, cuts to Social Security, you know. And um, even Democrats, like our own Democrat Jimmy Panetta was in on a meeting, and I don't know the details of it, so I don't want to imply anything, but the idea was perhaps we could now cut Social Security. What about these mom and pop uh, owners of homes who now, this is how they're going to stay off the streets when they retire. And we're getting down to the wire. We have so many questions. Um, Josh, do we have another email too? We do. We have another email too, but Josh, why don't you answer that, then we'll go to the email and we're going to have to have you all back. Uh, answer this the home ownership question yes yes uh, a very difficult one uh, yeah. to leave me with um i think that uh, <laughs> sorry it's okay i think that is the reality right now i think that part of the tenants movement part of the public housing movement and part of the labor movement all together should be recreating the safety net so that these investments are not as essential uh, I'm sorry I don't have a more <laughs> easy answer, but that's what it boils down to is I don't blame people who who think or see their homes as their safety net. Like I think about my own retirement and like what will I, how long will I be able to live after I stop working? Yeah. And like how long can I do that without owning a home, which yeah. I don't own a home? And so I don't, yeah, I, do, I would never, I would never like create a movement against people who believe that they need this safety net because in many instances, people do need that. Right. But we could push back on equ private equity. We could push back on for these sure. major hedge funds. We could uh, advocate for progressive candidates to promote social housing across the United States. That is what we need. We have one more email uh, question, I believe, and we have like a minute to answer it. So we'll pick one person, Mei Ling. Okay. The email reads, Yimby is working to reduce barriers to building public housing. SCA-2 proposes to repeal Article 34 of the California Constitution with the goal of making it legal to build low-income and public housing in California cities. Originally passed in 1950, Article 34 gives wealthy California neighborhoods veto power over affordable housing, enabling an ongoing segregation and preventing housing from being built where it is needed most. Let's have Reb Reggie address that, and we got to keep it short because we're going to have to cut yeah. out here. I mean, what we're talking about is a vote. We don't have a situation where people are voting against public housing right now. Public housing doesn't even like isn't even being built. This is kind of like a measure M at the state level almost, but it's never happening. So it's it, you know it's nice that they're fighting for this. I like it, but we're never reaching the point of voting on public housing. I would love if we were, but that's not the case. It's okay. Let's go to Amadi. You'll get the final word. Oh my gosh! What's <laughs> if you want to speak to that, Yimby is supporting. The last email was that Yimby is supporting legislation, but you probably wouldn't know because you're not in California. But would you like to say anything about anything that we've talked about here this last hour? Yeah, I'm not too plugged in on California, but I can say that legislation is not like the final frontier for like tenant rights or tenant advocacy. So like the best. You're, you're your own advocate. Like, you know, our laws are never going, are always going to have gaps in them. They're never going to fully protect us um, or support us. Thank you so much. And we're going to have to wrap this up, you guys. I hope you might come back for a part two. Uh, thank you all for being yeah. here. Thanks thank so you much. so much. Yeah. And thank I do want to, yes, Reggie said thanks, but his mic was already cut. So. <laughs> you are welcome, Reggie. On Twitter, you can find Amadi at A M A D I. O Z I E R at also Mad Tenant Power M A D Tenant Power uh, on Instagram Killing It Smalls K I L L I N I T S M A L L S and Mad Tenant Power also uh, go to the YouTube channel Radical Planning to find Josh the Radical Planner on, and also Josh is on Twitter at, at Rad underscore 
planner. Reggie is on Instagram at Santa Cruz Cares. Um, and our next show, Monday, March the 4th, is with the amazing Nadine Saylor, uh, an Army of One activist on Instagram and TikTok. She is known as the warrior goddess for the resistance. She does amazing, courageous, creative resistance work across the United States, and she travels everywhere to do this. It's going to be like Walter Masterson, but in a slightly different form. And she is a follow-up to that show and part of our Army of One activist series. We will include notes from today's show, including a link to Rebecca Solnit's London Review of Books article at our show page at ksqd.org. Please contact the Moment of Truth team at amy, A-M-I, at ksqd.org with questions or comments about our program. Find our new podcast and like, review, subscribe, and comment at Apple and YouTube. Amy's coaching and education website is at www.amychen.org. Com. Moment of Truth gives many thanks to our team, Nyanko Nyasu, sound and tech engineer, and our research and production team, Nyanko, Mailing Obinada, Todd Zimmerman, and Bara Ramakrishnan. Todd Zimmerman of Nativeverse Studios created the theme song. Kathy Krizik created our logo. Thanks to our KSQD program manager, Howard Feldstein, and the entire KSQD team on the California Central Coast where this show originates. Thank you for tuning in to Moment of Truth. And remember, if we don't use our democracy, we lose our democracy.